Welcome to the American College Surgeons Bulletin Brief from the Frontline Surgeons Voices. With me today are two surgeons, Drs. Julia Coleman and James Jang, both of whom are members of the Committee on Trauma Advocacy Pillar Engagement Workgroup. They collaborated to co-author an article in our March Bulletin on the importance of early engagement and getting to know our legislators. Welcome, Dr. Coleman. Welcome, Dr. Jang. Thank you. Thank you. Glad you could be with us today. And, and I'm really happy to see younger surgeons engaged with the PAC and with the efforts that are so important to us in maintaining dialogue with our legislators. But it's one thing to hear that from me, it's another from you. So I'd like perhaps to start with Dr. Jang and give us a little background on this initiative. The initiative centers around the Committee on Trauma's desire to increase participation in Surgeons PAC. We don't have the participation on Committee on Trauma that we think is necessary and compulsory to have a loud voice on Capitol Hill. And we have been casting about for novel ways to engage Committee on Trauma members to get involved, to contribute to Surgeons PAC, to be part of the grassroots efforts it's so very important because everything we do is predicated and underwritten by what goes on in, on Capitol Hill. Uh, legislative efforts, both positive and negative, deeply affect our ability to practice surgery uh, and to look after the patients the way that we know they should be looked after. Well, th thank you very much. D Dr. Coleman, as you speak to your colleagues in your, your peer group, what is the general response about participating in advocacy and, and, and how do you in turn reply to them if they're not enthused? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Wexner. I, I think it's a great question because we found that ultimately our potential for participation has really been untapped. And so I often find when I talk to my colleagues about the opportunities for surgeon advocacy, they're either not aware of them or don't really realize the importance. And I think as a community of surgeons, our failure to aggressively participate in the political underpinnings of healthcare finance and advocacy is, is extremely, extremely crucial. So we've written an article in the bulletin that ultimately is a call to action to surgeons and in particular for my generation and the importance of advocacy, um, highlighting that a surgeon's voice must be heard in advocacy, that a surgeon's advocacy matters, and that apathy is the greatest hindrance to affecting change. So with that rather generic uh, reply to your colleagues, to your peer group, do you have any specifics in addition that you would layer on and say, for example, through surgeons participating in dialogue in DC, we accomplished X. That's a rather leading question, I know. I think there are several potential opportunities to get involved, several avenues and recent success stories from this last year that are really exemplary of what can be accomplished with surgeon advocacy. For one, I tell my colleagues to get involved in RAS and YFA, specifically through the Advocacy and Issues Committee. Uh, there's also opportunity to get involved in Surgeons PAC and follow Surgeons Voice. Um, and certainly within the Committee on Trauma, there's many opportunities for advocacy as well. And I think even this last year, we have several success stories of why advocacy matters. Uh, there was a proposed rule that would have cut Medicare payments to surgeons and ultimately increased reimbursement for services from primary care physicians. And we had a huge uh, role in advocating around that issue. Um, and in general, there was an end of year funding bill uh, this last year, just signed a few weeks ago, that was packed with ACS legislative victories, whether that was related to surprise billing, uh, to reimbursement, uh, to rural care. So I think there are many success stories um, that are exemplary of how important it is for us to be involved. Great. That's very, very helpful, Dr. Coleman. Um, and you, you indeed hit one issue very hard, which is an important one about the well, two of them. Uh, about the proposed cuts and, and about the surprise billing. Um, Dr. Jing, uh, any additional uh, advice that you give people on engagement besides what we've heard thus far? Well, even though we had a legislative victory for the uh, cut to surgeons payments, the, the bad news is that is only protective for a year. So there's still a huge fight ahead of us to not let that come at us at the end of this coming year. Uh, there's a lot of work that remains to be done to try to make that a more permanent fix. Uh, the cuts were upwards of 10% for surgeons incomes. 
And in the face of loss of income during the COVID-19 pandemic for a lot of surgical practices, that's an existential threat. So we need to continue to dive into involvement on Capitol Hill because we still have existential threats for our practices and our patients' welfare in this very austere uh, financial environment that we find American medicine in. I also quickly want to add that uh, it's not just Dr. Coleman's generation uh, that is going to benefit from this publication. I think by virtue of the young future leader setting an example, my generation of surgeons uh, will take note of the fact that there's a benchmark that the next generation is setting. And that benchmark is something that we need to adhere to as well in terms of participation. Yes, um, can you give us an idea? That's an, an excellent point because it seems we have multiple generations represented here, but globally as we cut across the swath of all fellows in the college, what is the level of participation in the pack for our fellows? The level of participation is uh, sometimes in the single and low double digits. Uh, and it really needs to increase significantly because Capitol Hill knows professional societies and their relative participation. And there's a threshold that if we fall below, uh, we will be taken less seriously within the halls of power. Uh, with great detriment to our ability to practice and look after our patients. In my generation, I can speak to that. In terms of Surgeon PAC, the giving this last year was 73% for YFA and 44% for RAS. So less than half of RAS membership, which is a huge cohort. We're talking about greater than 13,000 constituents. Um, that Of those 13,000, less than half are participating actively. And so I think that really is a, a call to action and goes to show that there's really much, much to improve on in our level of participation. Very, very good points. And, you know, it, it's been said if everybody uh, were to forego like one nice dinner out every month and instead contribute that money to the PAC, we, we would be at the top of the PAC, no pun intended, for various medical societies for, for giving. Uh, sadly, that hasn't happened. Um, let me ask you if you're facing any new challenges, it's a ready challenge, you know, getting people to participate. Are you facing any new challenges since recent events in, in DC? Are, are people becoming less inclined to give or alternatively, perhaps people are saying, now I see the importance. I'm, I'm curious as you have your conversations. Let me take a stab at that. One of the other initiatives within our engagement um, work group was to try to get previous contributors to PAC who had lapsed to uh, re-engage uh, this past year. Uh, it was a partially successful effort towards the end of the year to have these lapsed PAC members uh, re-contribute, uh, but it still wasn't the degree of success that uh, I was hoping for personally. Clearly the difficulties that a lot of our fellows of the college have experienced in this past year uh, due to the uh, COVID crisis uh, are filling their vision in terms of their attention and maybe even at their pocketbook. Uh, so we are sensitive to that, but I think I want to quickly add that it's not necessarily the amount that's contributed. A any amount that's contributed, stand up and be counted, is really much more important. Uh, even, even a small contribution and the fact that you, you stand up and be counted as a PAC member goes a long way towards our good offices on Capitol Hill. Speaking of the office on Capitol Hill, uh, part of your article covers getting to know your legislators. So maybe I could ask Dr. Coleman, how does that relationship begin? How does it occur that a surgeon gets to know his or her legislator? I think there's several avenues to do that. And one is, again, I, I will continue to highlight Surgeon's Voice as an incredible resource where you can go online and you can readily identify who are your legislators, what are hot topics and things right now that the ACS is advocating around, and how you can quickly send pre-filled out letters and personalized letters to your legislators. It's very expedited and easy to use. So I really highly encourage people to check out that website. That's one way. And then another is what's more valuable than face-to-face -face time. Now, of course, in the setting of COVID, that has changed. Changed. But um, 
last year uh, was the first year that we did this virtually, the Leadership and Advocacy Summit, which is a big event that's put on by the American College of Surgeons every spring, where thousands of surgeons and residents and fellows uh, actually go to Capitol Hill and meet with their legislators, their House representatives, their senators, their staff, and talk about the ACS asks. And so um, that's another great opportunity to get involved as well. So I highly, highly encourage um, residents and, and fellows to uh, look into the Leadership and Advocacy Summit. You know, that's an excellent point. And in fact, this year, the Leadership and Advocacy Summit has been changed in day patterns to participate, to facilitate participation. Um, and it, in a way, it's very nice because the people with whom we make appointments will have dedicated time as we're doing today on the screen, looking and listening. So it, it's quite good. Um, Dr. Jang, in terms of the Leadership and Advocacy Summit, if, if uh, could you give us a brief snapshot of, of what happens during those conversations? Well, uh, I think that the key event beyond uh, the socialization within the college members is the, the visits up on Capitol Hill uh, in the past in person, now virtual. It's actually a very positive experience because you really feel that you are part of a participatory a democracy, a representative democracy. And there's this stiction that you need to get over the first time you do it. But once you get over that stiction, you really feel like you're being an American and that you're up there in the halls of power and you're representing your group. And it's, it's just an overwhelmingly positive experience that I think once uh, fellows of the college partake of it, they'll be doing over and over again uh, throughout their career. Uh, a real warm feeling from doing it. Well, th thanks very much. And I appreciate the time you've both taken with me today, uh, but more importantly, the time you, you've both taken uh, working together on, on the COT Advocacy Pillar Engagement Work Group and, and writing the article to enlighten us. I'll ask each of you if you have any final words you, you'd like to contribute, uh, Dr. Jang first and Dr. Coleman. My, my final word is that the advocacy website of the Marin College of Surgeons makes it child's play for you to make an appointment for your senators and congressmen. I, I went on the site and I immediately got a uh, sit down virtually uh, with Senator Toomey's office in, in Pennsylvania. So it's so easy for any fellow of the American College to go through that website and make an appointment for the congressmen or the senators. And I highly recommend it. Thanks very much. Excellent point. And, and also for sending letters, as you mentioned earlier. The letters, when you put in your zip code, they're pre-populated. You just and it. it's just a, it's a single button to press. It, it couldn't be simpler. It's total child's play. And the grassroots effect uh, made all the difference in blocking the payment cuts to surgeons uh, this year. So super huge to keep sending those letters with the single button push. Absolutely agree. And I applaud your efforts, Dr. Coleman. Yeah, I would close with, I think advocacy is something that anyone can do, and you don't need any background in politics and in healthcare finances to be an advocate. All you have to do is care about your patients and be a surgeon, and this is part of what surgeons do. So I hope that this is a call to action to make a commitment every day or every week to do something for advocacy. It doesn't mean making a donation. It means reading an article, making a new contact, talking to colleagues or representatives, finding a local organization that's engaged in advocacy, any act of advocacy on behalf of our patients and ourselves as physicians. So how, whatever act that is, however small, it's important if everyone does it. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for your time, your expertise, your efforts, uh, ultimately on behalf of our patients. Very, very important work. Thank, thank you. you.